And I'm excited to welcome Derek Marshall, the next senior pastor of Duluth Gospel Tabernacle. Come on, brother. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Okay. Is my mic on or I'm in this mic? All right. Greetings. You guys look good. How about you compliment your neighbor sitting beside you? Tell them they look good, they smell good. <laughs> Say it by faith if you don't mean it. Amen. I am, uh, this is wonderful to be here. Um, it's our first kind of official time being able to communicate with you in this way. And uh, before I say that, I just want to say that Pastor Roth has been amazing to, uh, to me and been very kind. And so uh, I don't know how long everybody's been here, but I'm assuming 25 years of having the same pastor. This might be a uh, difficult or scary time, uh, but we just trust the Lord in it as well. Uh, you know, we all have to take risk. You know, we, we, uh, we hopped in our car in uh, late November to move up north. <laughs> we all have to take our risk. <laughs> but it's been fantastic. We went to the uh, Bentleyville last night and gone a couple times. And it's cr pretty inc incredible, like the idea of a light lighted, if you will, Christmas tree or glowing Christmas tree was, was an old tradition by a theologian. And his idea was that Christmas needed to glow in the sense of that a light needed to shine. And we've kind of translated this uh, tradition over years into it's become a little bit secularized. But as I'm walking and watching all of these lights and thinking about the colors of these lights and how they come together in this tapestry to form something beautiful, I think about the church itself, just the church and how, uh, how amazing God would use different cultures and different colors and nationalities to come together to form something that would echo his beauty and light up the, the world in a time that the world certainly needs to be lit up. And so that's a very good thing. The other thing I'll say this morning is <clears throat> I'm a very interactive preacher. I'm getting a little bit loud. I'll ask you a couple times for amens. Even if you're saying amen, I'll probably even tell you to say it again. But I like that we, we interact with each other because the, uh, if anybody deserves loud cheers, it's Jesus, right? I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, let's see, Minnesota Vikings, the Cowboys who I like, they don't have a heaven or hell to put us in. Come on, somebody. And we pay money and scream real loud for them when they score, and Jesus has already got the victory for us, and here we are in church not uh, acting like it's exciting. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to push you to be excited and look at each other and tell them the gospel and smile at me. Come on, somebody, smile at me, because um, I like to smile. I'll smile at you, and you smile at me, and then we're all happy with that. I see the youth up there. How you doing, youth? Is that all the youth up there? Good. Good. I'll look at you every once in a while and uh, cheer you on and, and praise the Lord for that. Okay, let's do this. I, <clears throat> I love Christmas. Everybody knows me, knows it's my favorite time of the year. Listen, it's the most wonderful time of the year, and I, as you get to know me, sing nonstop. OK, we'll be sitting at a gas station and I'll be singing because that's just what I do. And I love to sing and I love Christmas songs because the best songs in the world are written for the Christmas season. So look at your neighbor. <clears throat> look at him. Look at him and say, you know, listen, say this. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. From now on, your troubles will be out of sight. Yeah, that's good. All right. That's good. Give yourself a round of applause. That's good. Okay. That's good. Now, I told Pastor Roth that my favorite song was O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and you did it this morning. I love that song. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. That's it. Here we go. Rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. 
I'm from the South, so I kind of hold on to notes. Okay. Shall ransom captive Israel. We'll do it one more time. Rejoice. Here it is. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Shall come to thee, O Israel. I think that's one of the most beautiful and important songs ever written. Why do you say that, Brother Derek? Because there's this prophetic promise that God promises us that Jesus would come to, to Israel, that he would come as a redeemer, as a savior, and they held on to that promise so much so that it was the way in which the Jews were accounted righteousness. They, they believed that a Messiah would come. It was through generations, through generations. The first prophetic promise that a Jesus, a child, God, would come and redeem them is found in the garden. Remember what happened when Adam and Eve fell. There was a, uh, a promise that God had to do. He went and killed a lamb or killed an animal, and he covered them with the skins of that animal. And that was promised that something, for something guilty to live, something innocent must die. Remember, he said, if you eat of this fruit, you shall die. And so he killed an innocent lamb so that they could live and cover them with the bloody skins of that lamb. The beauty of that is Jesus came as the innocent lamb died on the cross, and he comes so that we can, what, live. And the promise is that he was born in a manger. And so when we read scriptures like Isaiah that tell us that comfort the people with this promise that he will come and straighten up the highways and all of these things. And the promise is that when he comes, all of the earth will see him together. Well, that promise was not fulfilled yet because when Jesus was born, he was born in a manger. It was very veiled. He told people not to tell anybody when he healed them. It was a very veiled promise that he would come. And so it happened, but it was veiled. But... The next time he comes, it won't be veiled. Come on, somebody. He'll come in the clouds and all the earth will see it together that Jesus is coming to the earth. So this promise that he would come to Israel has partly been fulfilled in the birth of Jesus, but in a veiled way. So when he comes the next time, when they were looking at Jesus ascend to the heaven, the angels said to him, why do you fix your eyes upon him? Because the same way he ascended, he will descend again. And this is the promise that his feet will appear on the mountain of olives and the mountain will rend in two. And so on Christmas, when we remember his first coming, we should think immediately about his second coming, that he had not lied when he said he was coming the first time, and he surely will not lie when he said he's coming the next time. And so in Christmas, when we say, oh, come and come, Emmanuel, we are beckoning to come back to the earth again. And just as he came the first time, he will come to us again. And he'll reign this time from Israel. He will bring his fulfillment of his promise, the one in which the Jews were hoping for, that the Messiah would come to them and bring forth a perfect kingdom on the earth. And yes, he will do so. And that's what I want to talk about today, the promise of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the promise of his son, Jesus Christ, or the son that was born in a manger. Now, I have to be honest, I got this message from Pastor Roth in his uh, sermon last Sunday when he was talking about the news and the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to embellish on that just for a moment, but if you can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Now, I have a little tradition, and there's traditions that the church does that I will begin to do as well, but I have a tradition that you can humor me with. Whenever I pick a, a, a title or a main scripture to read from, I always have my congregation stand with me, because when you stand, it's really honoring somebody that's important has walked into the room, right? If the president walked in, they would say, hail the chief, and everybody would stand. And so I think if anybody needs the attention in standing, it's the word of God. So as we read this today, would you all stand with me as we read the word of God today. It also makes you pay attention because when you're seated, you can fall asleep, but you know, when you're standing, you, can, you have to be paid attention. Look at Isaiah's word. The eagle eye prophet, he says this, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting, or Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, And there will be no end to the increase of his government or his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish it. Luke chapter 2 verse 10, we'll read it quickly. 
But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. God, may we understand and proclaim the good news in Jesus' name. You may be seated. <clears throat> in a time of <laughs> bad news, especially, you know, depending on your pr particular political affiliations or whatever you believe, certainly the news can be bad or good for you determining or, or depending on the November or election season. Not only that, many of us have rough things whenever we look at the news <clears throat> I find that the bad news or the scare tactics of the news oftentimes is what sells. It sells advertisements, it sells newspapers, it sells uh, whatever it is that people are drawn to bad news. And sometimes we need to remember that there is good news and hope for the body of Christ. Really, I learned this several years ago, especially when it became about election season. I understood that I did not put my faith in an election but I put, it my, I put my faith in the resurrection, the hope of Christ Jesus. And so my faith will not be tossed to and fro based upon the circumstances of the world. If somebody likes me, if somebody is putting me in a position or putting me in, in good, uh, you know, good uh, saying with them, or whatever the case is, I know who I am and I'm rooted in the good news of the scripture. And we have to remember that no matter how the news is that are surrounding us, that we have good news. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. Now this is particular good news to the broken man or the lonely woman. In this time, this season, oftentimes it's a hard time for many people because you remember those family members that you have lost and uh, particularly can be hard. I know a friend of mine that's doing a service called Blue Christmas because they, have, or they are trying to minister to those who have had remarkably tough and difficult times. Maybe it's financially. Maybe some things have changed in your life. Maybe things are hard, but certainly the promise of the cross is applicable to every part of our lives. Really, it is. The promise that he has come to us, and not only has he come to us, that he gave his life for us, and not only did he give his life for us, that he's not dead and he's alive is good news. How's that good news? Well, it's good news for your marriage if you're struggling because there is a resurrection even in your marriage. Come on, somebody. That's good news if you're struggling with your children because no matter how bad the situation gets, there is a promise that he will come to us and he will bring beauty even out of the ashes and out of the hard things. So for that parent that's parenting teens or for that grumpy old man during Christmas time, listen, there's good news for him as well. God himself not only has won every battle, he is going to win again and again and again. No matter the circumstances that we find ourselves in, no matter who we're hoping for, believing for, putting our trust in, there is one that will not lie and has not failed us, and he cannot fail himself. This is the point. This is in your notes. We have a God that really does go to the lowest places, to the most lost of them, who is full of compassion and has been touched by the feelings of our infirmities. That's a big point, too, when you think about Jesus in this season. I'm amazed with the humility of Christ. And it's not just the humility of Christ that we find on the cross, but think about it. Jesus is humble in a manger. The God of the universe confines himself to a baby and allows his creation to take care of him. Wow, that's intense. Not only intense, but think about the God of the universe houses himself for nine months in a womb. Wow confines himself to a womb for nine months. This guy, how humble this one is. And you know why he does that? So that he can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Not only does he come for the adult who gives his life to Jesus Christ, of course, he comes for the broken and from that kid and from that crazy two-year-old that you might have that goes crazy all the time. I'm talking about mine. But he came for him as well. Not only the two-year-old that goes crazy or the, or the baby rocking in the womb, but the one or in the, in, the, in the manger or whatever you call that thing that you put babies in, bassinet, whatever it is. I should know I have four of them. But anyway, whatever it is, he also has come for that child in the womb. Wow, Jesus knows the feelings of that tiny baby inside of the womb. He has come to know us. And I got good news that he has come for that child and all of us as well. 
The beauty is that God is still the winner. He was betrayed and he won. He was lied upon and he won. After loss, loss of his friends and his relationship, he still won because that is who he is. Look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Notice this. It says this. Speaking of the coming of the advent of Jesus Christ, it says this. When the fullness of time had come, God had sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Born under the law. When the fullness of time came, God sent his son. I love this idea that God sent his son because that word there is not just, uh, it's not just specific of the father sending his son because he had to go, but this is the totality of the Godhead. God sent his son. <clears throat> but I'd love to talk about the father if you've heard me preach before. And I like to say this, there is a street that leads to the Father's house, and that street's name is Jesus Christ. And this idea is that Jesus came into the world as a child, as a baby, so that we can become the sons of God. Look at John chapter 14, verse 6. And Jesus says to them, watch this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. This is going to be a big point that we're going to talk about a little bit later. But this is the idea that we have access not only to God, but we have access to a father that is good and loves us perfectly all the time. Now, I love my children, but I'm not always a good father. Like, I mess up sometimes. I may yell at them when I shouldn't yell at them and I have to repent. And, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I did that. I really ruined it this time. But I know a father who always handles his children the right way, and that's the same father that you and I could have as well. We have access to this Father, and there's a reason we have access to this Father through the revelation and the story of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, <clears throat> this is kind of a side, sidebar. I chase a lot of rabbits, but I was listening to this podcast with this really intellectual um, thinker, and he was talking to this Muslim, and, and I don't honestly know a lot about the, the, the Muslim culture and, and all this, but I was listening to him engage, and he was talking about Allah in terms of Allah has no sons. He bears no sons. And so he was proving this point that the, the, the that G, he was trying to prove a point that Jesus could not be the son of God, okay? That, that he was just a prophet and not the son of God. But anyway, he was bringing forth his intellectual argument, and he listens, or he tells the the, the really smart uh, in, intellectual, he says to him, if I could prove to you if I could prove to you that uh, Allah is the right way, would you convert to Muslim right now? Would you convert right now? And so as he was telling them this, I thought myself, if he could intellectually and, and, and factually, that's what he said, prove that Allah was the right way, would you convert? And I asked myself that question. And then he began to say all these points. Well, uh, uh, Muhammad prophesied this, and then 400 years later or 40 years later, this came to pass. And so I thought about this in my own heart, and then I thought, man, this is, I'm getting back to the message in just a second. But I thought, man, there's three reasons why the answer to me would be an unequivocally no. Resounding no, there's three reasons. Number one, Jesus has receipts too. How many prophets and how many words in the Bible have come to pass and are still coming to pass? Think about the words that says, can a nation be made in a day? A nation be made in a day, speaking of Israel, and after uh, 2,000 years of a country being spread all over the earth, in one day, Israel becomes a nation again. Wow, that's pretty good. And if that can happen just like the word of God says, then guess what? He's going to come back again. So Jesus, Jesus has receipts too, Muhammad. That's what I would say to that brother, number one. Number two, I've experienced the power of God for my life, and that's not nothing. I've seen the gospel work in my life, and that's real, so I'm not going to go on to somebody else that I don't have any trust or knowledge of. Come on, somebody. I've experienced the power of the cross for myself. I've been broke free from addictions and all kinds of things because the power of the gospel, and that's very important. All right, you want to hear my third one? This is my third one going back to the notes, going back to our message. It's a better story. It's a better story. The Son of God became man, put upon flesh, and died because he loved me. That's pretty good. And not only did he die because he loved me, he's going to share his greatest inheritance with me, and that is his father. That's pretty good news right there. Allah has no sons. Well, what? I get to be a son of God. Come on, somebody. Now we are the sons of God. We know not what we shall appear, but when we see him, we shall be like him. That's good news. Yeah. To the orphan, that's good news. That we don't just 
serve God out of fear and out of obligation. But we get to partake in his goodness. And we get to sit in his feet, not as slaves, but as sons and daughters. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the world's greatest father. The way to the father is found in the son Jesus and his desire is to make us one with him. Jesus prays this in John chapter 17. He says that they might be one even as we are one. He says this to the father. Just like me and you, father, are one, I pray that they would be one with us. As I am in you, that they will be in us. And then Jesus has the nerve to say this, that you have loved them with the same love that you loved me. Did you know God loves you the same way he loves Jesus? Come on, that's a good story right there. So when I look at the Muslim, I say, no, (laughs) we have a better story. The father loves us so much, I love this point. The father loves us so much that he sent his son to gain son. He sent his sons to gain more sons. Look at John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last days. Notice how passionate and intense this is. You know the scripture, John 3, 16, the most famous scripture in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish and have eternal life. It is not that God so loved the world that he thought highly of them or even that he sent an angel or a cloud or any of these things. God so loved the world that he sent his son. He sent his son. God so loved the world that he expressed his love to us because love is an expression. Have anybody in this room seen the movie What's Love Got to Do With It? It's an old 90s movie. And so if you're an old 90s person like me, you'll love it. I don't know if, yeah, anyway. It's a movie about Ike Turner and Tina Turner. Come on, y'all, big wheel, keep on turning. <laughs> Proud Mary, keep on burning. You know the song. And in the movie, it talks, there you go, you got it. Yeah, there, there it is. You watch that movie too much, amen. Anyway, <laughs> so in this movie, they have a very abusive relationship. And at one part of the movie, I can slap it on Tina and says, don't you know I love you? Listen, love is an expression, and you prove your love by expressing it, and that's what Jesus did. He didn't just say, I love you with all my thoughts. He loved the world so much that he gave and expressed his love through the giving of his son. The son of God became the son of, God became the son of man so that man could become sons of God. The Son of God, Jesus, became the Son of Man so that man could become sons of God. And guess what? That's good. Yeah. Look again, Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because you are sons, God sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, cry Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer slaves, but a son. And if a son, therefore an heir through God. Now that's really packed right there. The adoption of sons, that's a spiritual work that happens. It's a transferal. It's like you've been in the world and God snatched you out of the world and placed you in a different position, and that position is sonship. No, you weren't before. You were formerly alienated. You were against God. Maybe you were even at war with God, but God snatched you out of that position and put you in a different place, and he made you a son of God. And because you are a son, he placed his spirit on the inside of you, and now your language changes which is really interesting. That Abba is like a baby saying Dada. It's the purest form of Dada. His whole language changes to one of dependency and even thanksgiving and love and all of those things because your language changes, because your position has changed. Why? Because you're no longer a slave. You're a son. And I would say that's pretty good news. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 9. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. 
and the government shall rest upon his shoulders, and he shall be called what? Wonderful. I love that. Wonderful. He shall be called wonderful. The government shall rest upon his his shoulders. This is a system, a kingdom, if you will. And this is the kingdom that we should live in no matter what's going on in our day. Now, there is a prophetic promise in Revelations that the kingdoms of this age will become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's good news because one day he'll be the president, the mayor, the king, the birth, I don't know, he'll, he'll run all of it, okay? He'll be totally in charge. That day really will come. But until that day comes in the earth, we are reaching, believing, and living in that age now. So I'm not going to be fearful of what the world can do to me. I'm going to be fearful of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Come on, somebody. I'm living for a different kingdom and a different world. And when it talks about the increase of that kingdom, we grow and that kingdom should expand in the earth. Man, this is supposed to be a Christmas message, but I'm really going into some of those things that I wasn't prepared to. Look at Matthew chapter 11. The systems will rest upon his shoulders. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says this, Come to me, those who are weary and heavenly laden, and I will give you rest. Take your yoke upon me, and I love this, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your soul For my yoke is easy, your burden is light. This is the good news, that we can give God our heavy burdens and he can give us something that's light. Some of you are carrying too heavy of things. You need to take off those heavy burdens and put on something that is light. One of my favorite verses in in Ezekiel, I think it's about verse 38 or maybe 37, but it talks about that when you go to the Lord to worship, and when you go into the, the, to serve, to minister to him, that's the words, when you go to minister him in, in the temple, it says you ought to take off all that that makes you sweat. I love that. Listen, don't sweat the small stuff. And if you are sweating, take it off. Because when you come to God, you're not supposed to have anything on you that makes you sweat. All those burdens, take them off. And the beauty is that he's wonderful enough to take our burdens for us. This is the principal reason why we can say that he's wonderful. One of the reasons why we can say he's wonderful. But the next point, he's not just wonderful, but he's a wonderful counselor. I love that. He's not an average counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. Now, Pastor Roth, I know you can agree with this. There have been times that people in our churches may have gone to counseling and it made them worse. Can you, maybe yes or no, I know there's some people that went to counseling and I was like, oh my goodness, if they didn't go to counseling, maybe their marriage would have been better. Maybe they, they came out of counseling crazier than they went in. And that's a terrible thing to say that somebody's crazy, please forgive me, but you know what I mean? <laughs> they maybe weren't crazy, but when they got out of counseling, man, it was some weird stuff going on in the counseling room. Let me say this about God. He's not just an average counselor. He is a wonderful counselor and that's good news. Think about it. If you're having problems and you needed somebody to talk to and somebody says, hey, I know somebody you can talk to and they're really good, you know, that's a good thing, right? But listen, I know somebody that you can talk to that's not only good, he's wonderful. Really wonderful. I, somebody said this once about somebody. They said, I'm going I'm to introduce you to somebody. And they, they're a little bit different. They need a whole team of psychologists, you know. And I thought, man, that's a terrible thing to say, but I would say this about myself. I know that I need a whole team of counselors. Let let, let me come back to this point because this is really cool. Look at John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus said, oh, you don't have it on the screen, but just turn your Bibles. It's not on the screen, but turn your Bibles to John chapter 14, verse 16. So Jesus is telling them about the Holy Spirit, which is to come. And and he said something for years that I missed. I missed this for years as I'm reading this text. He says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. I always knew that that helper there was a pointing to the Holy Spirit because he's promising us the Holy Spirit would come and the Holy Spirit would do a nu- numerous amounts of things. But he says, I will give to you a helper. That word there for helper is the word parakletus, where we get the word counselor. It's the same word or the same idea that's in Isaiah chapter 9. So he says, I will give you a counselor. But I miss this one word that's very important. He says, I will give you another helper, another counselor, another comforter, another advocate. Wow. 
You know what this means? Number one, this means we really cannot lose with God. Think about this. The word counselor or paracletus is also the word advocate. It's like a, it's like a, uh, a, a term that is used in court, like somebody that is your defendant, okay? Think about this just for a second. So the father is the judge, right? He's the great judge. He's the judge of heaven and earth. He's not just a judge. He is the judge. And he gives to us two people that would stand as our advocate, our counsel, if you will. And so now we have the Holy Spirit who stands as our counselor, but Jesus says he's going to give you another one. Why is he giving you another one? Because Jesus is also your advocate. Listen, you thought Johnny Cochran was good. You thought, it, you thought OJ had the dream team. You have the dream team. You have the greatest lawyers in the history of the world on your side, and the judge is his dad. Come on, somebody. That's good news. So Jesus is our advocate, our comforter. Jesus is our counselor, and he's a wonderful counselor. And he promises that the Holy Spirit, he will give us another one. Wow. We get two for the price of one. He's a mighty God. I love that. Growing up, we used to say, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth. That's it. Y'all sang it too? Come on, somebody. That wasn't just in black churches. That's everybody. Okay, good. (laughs) The central truth of the gospel is that God has provided a way of salvation for men to come to him through the gift of his son to the world. He suffered as the sacrifice for sin, overcame death, and now offers to share his triumph to those who receive him. The gospel is good news because it is a gift of God, not something that must be earned by penance or self-improvement. Thank God. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 14, 15. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Matthew chapter 4, 23 through 25. And Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, preaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the, of the kingdom, healing all kinds of diseases. The news about him spread throughout all the town and they brought him, uh, they brought all that were ill and suffering with all various diseases and He healed them, verse 25, and large crowds followed him. The gospel doesn't just save you in your sin, but it literally saves you from your sin, and it has a positive result upon your body as well. Because not only is he powerful enough to heal you or forgive you from your sins, he's also powerful enough to heal your body. And you know what? Even if you die, the gospel's still applicable to you because your body then won't rot in a grave. Come on, somebody. There'll be a resurrection. If the worst thing can happen is that I die, I'm going to come back. Come on. I'll be back. Come on, somebody. I'll be back. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. We talked about that. That because of the work of Jesus Christ, now we are not, no longer slaves, but now we're sons of God. I love this. Prince of peace, Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can release supernatural peace. The only one that can bring sustainable peace. And that's why there's a false lie and an ideology, a, a ideology out there that it's religion that is the reason why there's so much dysfunction in the earth. That is baloney. Baloney. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I would go forward to say that it is because of the Judeo-Christian ideology that the most wonderful government in the history of the world was formed. And I wish somebody would say amen. amen. Now, there's nuance to that, and we can argue about the imperfections of it, but it won't be perfect until he comes, and that's why we say, God, we want you to come. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down to us. And just as you reminded us that you came the first time, we thank you that you're not a man that you should lie. You will come again. 
Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It says this, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes all comprehension or understanding will guard your heart and your mind. Watch this in Christ Jesus. Where is that peace rooted on in? Christ Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the only one that can give real peace. He's the only one that can give sustaining peace, even in all kinds of drama, when all the world is being tossed to and fro, it's the only place that we can find peace in the middle of storms. Maybe that's why Jesus was asleep on a pillow in the time of a hurricane or a storm that was rising when he was on a boat with his disciples. And watch this, <clears throat> at the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. I love that scripture. That means that he will grow in his increase and in his power until the end of the age comes. You know, people, people really get me when this, this fear about Jesus coming to the earth is like, oh man, I don't want, oh, it's going to be bad. Listen, even if it's going to get rough in the earth, hey, who are we? We're the sons of God. Come on, somebody. We're Christians. We live in a different kingdom. The end of the age will be the greatest time in human history for the Christian. Now, if you're opposed to him in that age, it's going to be the worst of times for you. But we're for him and not against him, and we should be beckoning him to come because he will increase his glory to the ends of the earth. Isaiah chapter 24 talks about how the earth tosses to and fro like a drunkard, but then it says that at the end of the age, to the ends of the earth, they will hear this song, Glory to the Righteous One. There will be a people singing in the darkest time, on the darkest day in human history, there will be a faithful bunch of people singing, Glory to God. They will be singing his praises to the ends of the earth. You know why? Because they live in a different kingdom. And they'll be increasing in the knowledge and the love of Jesus Christ until the end. And guess what? That's good news. Because if it was the other way, it wouldn't be good news anymore, right? If things are just going to get bad and then Jesus is going to come to rescue us, guess what? That's not really good news. The good news is no matter how bad it gets and how dark it gets, there will be a light that shines upon his people, and we will be able to know that he's near us to the ends of the earth. All right, <clears throat> I got three L's and then I'm done. Three L's the good news brings. Number one, <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus' birth Number one, it brings life. John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will, will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? It's light, or excuse me, it is life. I love this text because Mary, or excuse me, Martha runs out to Jesus in this particular text and says, hey, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus responds to her in a beautiful way. He says, listen, I am the resurrection, the truth, and the life. If your brother believes in me, though he is dead, he will live again. You know what caused Lazarus to rise from the dead? As he responded and he believed that God could rise him up from the dead. Though he was dead, he believed. Listen, that's life, eternal life. Maybe we're sad that we don't see our blessed family members at this moment, but we have hope that because of the life of Jesus Christ, the good news is, hey, we will see them again. There will be a day at the shout of the archangels, the dead will rise first and we will be caught up in the clouds. It will be the most blessed family reunion of all time. Now, I don't know about you guys, but my family reunions get a little bit crazy. And sometimes I don't want to see them people, but I will tell you, there will be a day will be the greatest. Nobody will be arguing about food. Come on, somebody. And what you said and how you hurt their feelings, there will be a day. Okay, your families are great. Good. Um, <laughs> number two, so he brings life and he brings love. You heard the scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, love abounds, and that we can walk in the blessed love of Jesus. And number three, you can come help me worship team. Number three, liberty. This is one we need to really talk about, and it's connected specifically to the birth of Jesus Christ. Liberty, Matthew 
Chapter 1, verse 27 says this, And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name, watch this, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The church has preached a lot about how we're saved in our sins, but we don't preach enough about how God can save us from our sins. That you can be saved, delivered, set free from even the addictions of the sins that easily beset us. Hey, that's good news, that he can make us free. Now, I've told this story, I think, in this church already, but I used to almost drown a lot when I was little. I didn't know how to swim, and so I was in a pool once, and I thought the pool got deeper as it went to the length of the pool, but it actually went, got deeper as you were going the width, and I didn't know that. And so I'm walking the width of the pool, and then all of a sudden I go under the water. Sad deal is my dad, who was watching me, he couldn't swim either, so he, I mean, he couldn't help me lest we both be under the water, I guess. And there was a sweet girl. I like to think of her as an angel because I never saw her again, but, you know, whatever. She was an angel from heaven. I I like to believe that. Um, But anyway, she snatched me out of the water, and I noticed something that she did to me that never is lost on me today is she didn't just pick me up and say, you're safe, buddy, and drop me right down in the water. And that's how sometimes we look at sin in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's like, it's like the father, what you call the, the grandfather clock, you know, sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness. The beauty of the gospel is he doesn't just take us and save us in our sins to continually fall back into our sins. He literally picks us up like that girl did and put me in a position in which I was safe and out of the dangers of the water. He picks us up sets our feet on the solid ground. Call his name Jesus. And it's important what you call him. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save you from your sins because his title is directly directly, uh, involved or it directly speaks of what he came to do. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save you from your sins. John chapter 8, verse 26. So if the Son make you free, you are free what? Indeed. Let it be so. This is the good news. This is the good news. And it is news so good that we ought to share it. And as we are participating in this Christmas season, we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My last text, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. So until the end comes, we preach this good news. It's always time to say it in word and in deed. And this year, really it is the most wonderful time of the year, right? While everybody else is being extra nice to us, unless you're Black Friday shopping or shopping right before Christmas. But for the most part, people have a little bit more grace for the gospel. So why don't we participate and share the good news? Could you stand to your feet? I'll ask the elders or pastors, however we do altar call here, but... If you have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ and wants to receive this gospel in your life, I ask you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that the good news of the gospel of Jesus would penetrate hearts all over the room so that those in the room will go to the ends of the earth proclaiming and preaching not just this news about a baby, but the news that he has come to us and he will come to us again. So Father, in the name of Jesus, would you draw those who are lost to the gospel of the kingdom in Jesus' name. So if that's you and you want to receive the gospel, just come down now and uh, we'll receive him, we'll receive you. And ask the people on your road, hey, have you received the gospel? Go ahead, ask them, ask them. Ask them, say, have you received the gospel? Received. Y'all good? Worship team, y'all saved? Okay, good. Everybody's good. All right. You can-
go ahead, whatever you're going to say. Father, we love you. We thank you for the news of the gospel in Jesus' name. Sing with me. Joy to the world, the Lord is come.